excellent, however, not only cannot escape the fate of being thus deprived of life and spirit, of being flayed and then seeing its skin wrapped around a lifeless knowledge in its conceit. Rather, we recognize even in this fate the power that the excellent exercises over the hearts, if not over the minds of men. Also the constructive unfolding into universality and determinateness of form in which its perfection consists and which alone makes it possible for this universality to be used in a superficial way. Section 52 is very short, just a few lines, but in it Hegel is sort of bringing to a close some of the reflections in the much longer section that preceded it. And he's talking here about how it is that what's, what's getting translated as the excellent, the fortreflicher, that which stands out. What does he mean by that? The dialectical process, the development of spirit, everything that's getting, you know, further and further along in the process, and our understanding of that as well, there's a risk for this. And we just talked about that before, even in the you know, famous Hegel triadic schema, there's a risk even in that of it becoming purely schematic, of becoming, as he's going to say, superficial. So what he says is that the fate of the excellent in this case, and the excellent could be whatever it is that we, we happen to be devoting our attention to. It could be the holy, it could be the beautiful, it could be reason, you know, intruding into institutions through history. It could be the development of family dynamics, you know. Um, any of these sorts of things can be deprived of life and spirit. And he uses the German Ent, you know, constructions, you know, they're Entgeistet. They, they literally are having spirits stripped away from them or distanced from them. They're, imagine that they're being put here in our consideration while the process is still going on and the real stuff is happening over there and we're looking at the digested form there. So they can be deprived of life and spirit. Interestingly, and Hegel is noting something that's, that's very important here, particularly for the practice of philosophy, it still has power, the, whatever it is that we're calling the excellent here, still has power over hearts, gemüter. He doesn't say herzen, he says gemüter, meaning sort of our affective centers, uh, where we have our sentiments, but not over minds. There's a lot of cases where people will get into a philosophical system, and now they see the world that way. But their commitment to it is really more emotional, or a matter of their desires, a matter of their, their interests in the sense of, you know, they are interested participants, uh, it is, is benefiting them in some way, rather than being called in by the colder and starker demands of truth, which is what Hegel would say, you know, Geist, mind, spirit, is sooner or later going to have to tackle. That's the force of the negative there. Um, he finishes by, by talking in this, this rather uh, turgid sentence about how developed, unfolded universality can be used in superficial ways. He's calling our attention to a risk that he's just talked about earlier in the section before that as being something like, uh, you know, turning... Hegel's, you know, account of the development of spirit through all these different gestalt and all these different stages of consciousness into something like um, all the jars, and this is not exactly the metaphor, all the jars full of different stuffs at the general store or going into the hardware store and, you know, pulling open all the drawers and there's that kind of screw, there's that kind of screw. It's organized. You can find stuff when you need it. Um, you can use it to do some sort of extrinsic project of your own, but the dynamism, the connection, the intrinsic development has actually been lost, and so any use of it is going to be superficial. It's, it's sort of taking over what was, you know, won through very difficult and laborious uh, centuries-old, decades-old work and culminating in the, the synoptic view of it that Hegel has, and then turning it into greeting cards, turning it into memes, turning it into 
schemas that you can easily plop things into. That's what he wants to caution us against. Uh, the next section, he's moving away from that. So this is kind of a culmination and linchpin section. Science dare only organize itself by the life of the notion itself. The determinateness which is taken from the schema and externally attached to an existent thing is, in science, the self-moving soul of the realized content. The movement of a being that it immediately is consists partly in becoming an other than itself, and thus becoming its own imminent content, partly in taking back into itself this unfolding of its content, or this existence of it, that is, in making itself into a moment, and simplifying itself into something determinate. In the former movement, negativity is the differentiating and positiving of existence. In this return into self, it is the becoming of the determinate simplicity. It is in this way that the content shows that its determinateness is not received from something else, nor externally attached to it, but that it determines itself and ranges itself as a moment having its own place in the whole. The understanding in its pigeonholing process keeps the necessity and notion of the content to itself. All that constitutes the concreteness, the actuality, the living movement of the reality which it arranges. Or rather, it does not keep this to itself, since it does not recognize it. For if it had this insight, it would surely give some sign of it. It does not even recognize the need for it. Else it would drop its schematizing or at least realize that it can never hope to learn more in this fashion than one can learn from a table of contents. A table of contents is all that it offers. The content itself it does not offer at all. Even when the specific determinateness, say one like magnetism, for example, is in itself concrete or real, the understanding degrades it into something lifeless, merely predicating it of another existent thing, rather than cognizing it as the imminent life of the thing, or cognizing its native and unique way of generating and expressing itself in that thing. The formal understanding leaves it to others to add this principal feature. Instead of entering into the imminent content of the thing, it is forever surveying the whole and standing above the particular existence of which it is speaking. That is, it does not see it at all. Scientific cognition, on the contrary, demands surrender to the life of the object, or what amounts to the same thing, confronting and expressing its inner necessity. Thus, absorbed in its object, scientific cognition forgets about that general survey, which is merely the reflection of the cognitive process away from the content and back into itself. Yet, immersed in the material, in advancing with its movement, scientific cognition does come back to itself, but not before its filling or content is taken back into itself, is simplified into a determinateness, and has reduced itself to one aspect of, exi of its ex own existence, and passed over into its higher truth. Through this process, the simple, self-surveying whole itself emerges from the wealth in which its reflection seemed to be lost. Section 53 is a long and rather involved section. I've got a sort of schema up here on the board. Hopefully it's not a schematic schema because we're going to be talking about schematism in this, right? But it's supposed to give you some way of, of conceptualizing the various movements and connections that, that Hegel's talking about in here. I don't have everything that he says up on there um, because it would be rather difficult to, to represent. But one thing that we ought to keep in mind when approaching this section is that Hegel is talking about two different things very explicitly. Well, really three different things. One of them is the contrast between scientific cognition and the, the workings of the understanding. When Hegel is criticizing the understanding, he's not saying that something like the Kantian understanding, which has its own categories that, you know, are, are sort of, you know, posted onto or imposed upon the phenomena so that we can make sense of them, that there's anything really wrong with that. Um, nor is it a criticism of Lockean understanding. You know, the, the understanding was used by a lot of different philosophers, 
The intellect is another way to translate it. What he's criticizing is a static view of the development of, of human knowledge that doesn't take into account the sort of reflexive position of the knower involved in this. And the fact that categories of the understanding really do, in fact, get generated through these, these processes. It's not as if they're all there and then, boom, we put them there. Because um, then we could, in fact, just have a table of contents that we transpose onto everything, or like grid work. So that's one point. Another thing that he's really focusing on, that's, that's what I've got over here, is the nature of real, concrete, determinate things. How do they get to be that way? How do they move from being into alterity from self and then reappropriate that back into themselves? Hegel thinks this is going on for anything that's actually worth studying. So this is, you know, sort of a, a way to, to capture, to think through the dynamism inherent in things that, that it, it gets lost from the perspective of the understanding. The other thing is he's trying to think about how should we understand um, the larger whole. Science is systematic, and one of the things that's attractive about the understanding is it does appear to be presenting things in a uniform systematic way. The trouble is that it flattens everything out and places it into these boxes or schemas or pigeonholes, however you want to think of it, and doesn't really get to what's actually going on in, in the phenomenon. So all three of these are coming together in this particular paragraph. There's another thing in the background, which is that we, we want to be thinking about the status of the knowing or thinking or acting subject, the one who's actually doing philosophy, the one who's actually adopting the scientific perspective on things, the one who has an understanding but is going beyond the mere schematism of, of the understanding, the one who is trying to make sense of the greater whole in which they themselves are a moment. And this can also apply to the, the, the human being who is doing the knowing of another being. So all that said, um, that's quite a few presuppositions to, to keep in mind. So he talks about, um, let's start here. It says, the movement of a being that immediately is. And the immediately there is, has been sort of read into it. Um, the German is Zeyende. Um, so what that means is a being, something that actually exists, something that is, something that can be run into or, or you know, experienced in one way or another, and the being of such a being, the movement involved in such a being, consists, in, he says, partly in becoming an other than itself. So we've, we've seen this, you know, at many points already discussed. Nothing is as simple as it appears uh, in, in the past philosophers wanted to try to boil everything down to the, the simplest stuff. They might have a monism where they think it's something simple that then becomes complex through differentiation. They may be pluralist in that they think there's a whole bunch of substances out there that are ultimately simple and we can't say much about them, but maybe they have qualities. Um, you can think of Locke as, as being along those sorts of lines. Hegel is saying nothing is simple. Nothing that actually matters is simple. It's already got within it this tendency to produce something other than itself. And Hegel says, um, this, by doing this, it becomes its own imminent content. So that means that it, it, for this being, the otherness is a way in which this being can come to, in whatever mode it has available for it to do this, get to know itself. You know, if we want to take a human being, I think it's easier when we look at large scale sorts of things. Uh, a human being thinks they know who they are. We have a, a sense of self-identity, right? And then um, we reflect upon ourselves, and if we're really being honest with ourselves, we come up with things that are incongruous, that don't actually fit into what we started with, and we say, well, that, that's not me, but 
actually that is me. And how is that me and not me at the same time? I guess, and this is why I put the dotted line here, I guess it really is me. And I wasn't quite what I thought that I was. You know, you can see something like this going on in, for example, um, the famous discussion of the faculties or parts of the soul in Republic Book 4, where Plato is having Socrates lead these young men through a discussion and says, you know, look, is the, is the soul just one thing? Or does it have, you know, different parts or faculties or operations? Um, how would we know that? Well, you know, we look for, for conflicts. Are there ever cases, we know that we desire things, uh, we desire a whole bunch of different things. So we have appetites. Maybe they're all really the same thing. Maybe it's just one big kind of desire, or excess appetite, epithumia, who knows. Is there anything that, that resists that? Is there anything that's, in this case, other than that? Rationality. Even if we were like pure, straight-out hedonists, or people who said that really it's all about desire, um, there would need, still need to be some sort of reasoning faculty or process that says, yeah, you know, let's do this desire, but not that desire, because they conflict with each other. Or it thinks out, how can I get my, how can I have my cake and eat it too, as the proverb goes. Um, that would already be do producing a kind of alterity there, something new, something additional. Um, following out this example, so the soul starts out as being something primarily desirous, then it also has something else that is also the soul. And then there's a process of taking it back. So the, the, it's been able to, by becoming more complex, adopt a position upon itself. It can be reflexive. Now, um, it says partly taking back into itself this unfolding of its content or this existence of it. That is making itself into a moment. This entire process here is how a thing makes itself a moment within larger holes, within environments, within things where, situations where there's going to be another kind of alterity, not just an alterity within itself, but the alterity of other moments. So he says, um, in the former movement, that is, in the becoming other, negativity is the differentiating and positing of existence. So again, let's go back to the Plato and, and Soul example. We realize that there's something else there. And, you know, Hegel's not very good at bringing this out right here, but we, we grasp things oftentimes through contrast we intensify the outlines of something by having something else that's not it next to it. And so that's part of what's going on here. The original thing that gets, gets things started becomes more determinate, stands out more. So does this other part that actually turns out to be something within it. It's all part of one big, larger, complex dynamism of, of its own. And so he says, um, that's negativity, and then this return into itself is the becoming of determinate simplicity, the becoming of determinacy, how it becomes a determinate, concrete being by having this, this activity going on within itself. This is a metaphysical description of how things actually are as opposed to the appearance, which says, you know, things are just what they are, you know. This is not a good example, but this piece of chalk is just a piece of chalk, you know. I, I, I don't really want to do a Hegelian analysis of piece of chalk, because I think that's really boring, but we can say that about all sorts of other things as well. So he says, um, it's in this way the content shows that its determinateness is not received from anything else. That's a very important point. A lot of people want to say that, that Hegel is all about, you know, system and things only have their meaning within the system as one moment in relation to other moments, so they don't really have any meaning or value or, you know, persistence or agency of their own. Here, 
he's saying, no, there, it, it does matter how beings, Zionda, Zionden, actually, encounter each other and engage with each other and interact with each other in terms of larger compositions, but as themselves, they already have this dynamic and this, this you know, development of otherness, of negativity within themselves and the process of taking it back. There's already this, this process going on within them you know, outside of their relations with other things. The relations with other things could enter into that, they will do that as we get into other parts of the phenomenology, but here he really wants to stress this point. So he says, um, the understanding and its pigeonholing process does something wrong. It keeps the necessity and the notion, the, the grift, the concept, to itself, which is what, what gives the thing determinacy. There's an internal necessity outside of the thing unconnected, at least at this level, to the other necessities that could be governing or ruling or arranging or ordering this whole. He says, um, the understanding tries to keep the necessity and notion of the content to itself. Everything that constitutes the concreteness, the actuality, the living movement of the reality, which it arranges. And again, we have to keep in mind that Hegel has a different notion of necessity than what many other philosophers are dealing with. Um, many philosophers would say there, there is no necessity when it comes to things that change, uh, or things that are not universals. Only, you know, when we get to the realm of particulars, there it's all contingency, Causes do come to, into play, but there, there, there's no internal necessity that governs everything. It's only when we like, you know, abstract that we can find necessity. Hegel is saying something very different. He's willing to say, yeah, there, there's that kind of necessity. That's, that's true, you know. Um, not going to rule that out. But there's also a necessity that's involved within the very life of a self-moving thing. Within the existence of of something that is actual and concrete. Um, it's quite a brilliant thought there. So he says, the understanding tries to keep this to itself, or rather it does not keep it to itself. Why not? Because it doesn't recognize it in the first place. Those who are, you, who are relying on philosophies of the understanding, when they encounter Hegelian dialectics, they will say, well, this just doesn't make any sense, you know. Um, he's, he's, he's saying all these things that it just seems kind of arbitrary. Well, that's because they've adopted this point of view as the way things must be, and they never actually entered into the Hegelian point of view. And when it comes to phenomena that Hegel wants to investigate, they don't actually look for necessity within the phenomena, because it's not going to be there anyway, because obviously it's, you know, it's a particular and they don't grasp the concept. They don't grasp it as a self-developing entity. So he says, um, all it can offer is a table of contents. The content, it does not offer at all. Very nice line there. So then he says, look, we'll use an example like magnetism. Even when the specific determinateness is itself concrete or real, the understanding degrades it into something lifeless, merely predicating it of another existent thing, rather than cognizing it as the imminent life of the thing, or cognizing its native and unique way of generating and expressing itself in the thing. So, this is not really the best example. Hegel is actually not at his best in dealing with purely physical phenomena, um, but let's go with him on this anyway. So we say, this is magnetic or iron operates according to, to magnetism, uh, aluminum doesn't, right? What we're doing there is we're predicating. And the understanding is really good at doing this sort of thing. X is Y. A is B. A falls into the class of things that are B. It's good at doing that. And we have a whole logic developed for dealing with, with you know, that sort of stuff. If you've actually got some input, you can process it, you can come up with some conclusions. That's all nice. That's not, you know, worthless. 
Um, there's lots of activities, lots of fields in which that's really great stuff. But it doesn't get at what the thing actually is. It's made assumptions. Rather, and, and those assumptions, the researchers who carry that work out in the first place, they might have actually done the sort of process of delving into the thing and figuring out its guts and its workings. Uh, but then it gets put in textbook form, and then people talk about it, and then people manipulate it sort of like a, a counter, like uh, that famous, you know, blank coin that's exchanged beyond, be, between people without saying anything. I think that's from a Mahler May um, poem. I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's our toe. Um, in any case, he says, um, the formal understanding leads it to others to add this principal feature. That is of actually understanding it. Instead of entering into the imminent content of the thing, which is this, it forever surveys the whole and stands above the particular existence of which it is speaking. That is, it does not see it, Hegel says, does not see it at all. It sees the particular only as particular as opposed to the universal about which we can actually have knowledge, real knowledge. And Hegel's saying, no, real knowledge also has to encompass the workings of real things. And those are particular, sometimes those are individual. So, he says, um, what does scientific cognition do instead? Demands surrender to the life of the object. This makes perfect sense. If you want to understand, for example, uh, here, here's an example from my, my own past. Um, when I first got into graduate school in philosophy, I was going to do philosophy of language. And the reason why I was going to do philosophy of language is because I had a real interest in, in foreign languages. So, um, you know, French was a semi-foreign language to me because my, my mother spoke French with me at home when I was a kid, but, you know, not, not an awful lot. So I learned French. Learned a bit of Mandarin, never very much, but, you know, practiced it with Chinese friends and students. Learned German so I could, you know, read stuff like Hegel. Uh, by the time that I was there, I was already working my way through Latin and I was soon to go into Greek. And I had an interest in, in languages as languages. So I wanted to do philosophy of language as a philosophical examination of what the hell's going on with this stuff that we call language. And I was shocked to find that a lot of the people in the field didn't actually know or evince much interest in foreign languages. Because, you know, they, well, you know, you're just going to generalize about, about things. So they read some Wittgenstein. But we're not even going to read Wittgenstein in German. Even though it's available. You can get facing page copies, just in case your, your German isn't good and you wanted to consult the English. And it really clicked for me when I was reading Ferdinand de Saussure's uh, course in general linguistics. And kind of funny, we were doing a reading group. And I had the, you know, French cours, and my friend had the very poorly translated version, um, and we only got through like a couple pages because he was saying, so, so Sir is saying this, and I'd say, he's not saying that at all. Here's what he's actually saying. Here's how I would translate that. Um, but one of the things that Saussure so said was, well, if you want to be a linguist, if you want to actually study languages, I think that you probably ought to actually study languages and not linguistics first. Learn some languages so you actually have some things to compare. Before you're going to do the theoretical work of, of trying to figure out you know, the way languages work, you need to actually have some exposure to the objects. You need to have entered into, as Hegel says, surrendered to the life of the object. Um, I wouldn't want to talk to a, a fish biologist who learned everything merely by uh, looking at textbooks and studies. I would want somebody who's probably actually gone fishing from time to time and who has been out there on, on the lakes and perhaps even on the oceans and handled fish in their hands and, and spent time being curious about them and looking at them and saying, oh, this is a strange thing. I would want somebody who, as most as they, they possibly could, would want to swim with the fishes. And it's that way for, for any other phenomena that we want to study. 
Um, one of the dangers that comes with this is, you know, the, the attraction of the, the, the understanding approach is, well, it's very objective. But it's also detached from the reality that it's supposed to be investigating. Does this lapse into pure subjectivism? Um, that's, a, that's a danger. Um, but it's a danger that can come up within the very system itself and be handled by the system uh, by saying, well, let's actually think our way through this. So he says, absorbed in its object, scientific cognition forgets about that general survey. This is this over here which is merely the reflection of the cognitive process away from the content and back into itself. What's going on with the understanding? The understanding approach is more about surveying the human mind and the way that it's organized and then turning to whatever the mind is going to study and inserting that content. Very, you know, counterproductive approach in part because the human mind is reflexive and because the human mind also develops historically in connection with other things, so including other minds, right? So it says, um, scientific cognition does come back to itself, but not before its filling or content is taken back into itself, is simplified into a determinateness, and has reduced itself to one aspect of its own existence and passed over into its higher truth. So Hegel's saying, look, you need both sides of this. You have to surrender in scientific cognition to the object, to the phenomenon, to what it is that you're going to be putatively knowing, understanding, interfering with, studying, arranging, ordering, or else give it up. You're not actually dealing with the thing itself. If you're going to be a philosopher of emotion, you better actually experience some emotions and spend some time watching other people experience emotions uh, before you start your theorizing. And you better spend as much time as it requires in order for you to grasp that content, not just enough time to fi finish a 15-week class or pass an a online test or something like that or get a certificate. The, the, the content tests you as to whether you fully understood the content. And then we arrange the content into these larger holes in which, yes, the content does assume more of its meaning, but part of the source of its meaning is coming from the very fact that it is something existing, which means that it is something that self-others. There is a process of negativity within it, not merely within us, not merely within the understanding, but also within the, the phenomena themselves. So, um, we finish by uh, him saying, through this process, the simple self-surveying whole, the self-surveying whole is a self-surveying whole because human beings are part of that. Human minds are part of that. Emerges from the wealth in which its reflection seemed to be lost. So, you know, in a, in a way it's sort of like a good news, bad news thing. Bad news is you got to really work and you can't skip any steps in understanding the process. Good news is if you do that, you can develop a synoptic view of the phenomena. And I would go, so I would go further and say if you're training yourself in this sort of approach to things, it's transferable. Hegel didn't actually figure everything out. He didn't survey every possible phenomena. His system has gaps, holes, lacuna in it. And we can use the Hegelian approach, uh, not schematically, but as something that we have internalized through our own practice. And this, is, this is a practice ground right here for doing that. This is the training wheels. This is the baby steps. Um, and a great book, too. Um, for being able to do that.